Evening everyone. Uh, just to begin with, I'm using a new microphone tonight. So if you need to adjust your volume up a little bit, do so. I think the other one was too loud. This one should be better quality. So uh, what I'm going to do today, because this is the last of the, the live streams before the local elections, I'm going to go over what I think are the things to look out for, because it's way more difficult than it is for general elections. And the thing is, like, this is the one. And I, I said a couple of years ago, this is the one. Last year's local elections, you know, Labour already had most of the seats. There were, they, Labour were never going to be able to make very ne many net gains last year. It was never a test. The Conservatives could be on for losing a load, and indeed they did, hundreds but it was never a test for, for Labour Conservative head-to-heads because Labour did so well in the same seats four years previous. This was the one. This is the one where the, most of these seats were contested for the last time in 2019. And that was an incredible, an incredibly bizarre year. It was the year that I had decided to grow this channel because I knew at the start of the year, politics was going to be insane. And, um, and although the Conservatives took heavy losses, they still ended up with the vast majority of the seats. And that is because Labour were just as unpopular than, as them at the time. And Labour, in, Labour suffered net loss as well. But I'm going to start off, you may ask what this picture is. Well, it's, it says what it is, it's Greg Hans there. I want to just point out Greg Hans is the Conservative Party chairman. It says that on his screen there. For those who don't know, this is Greg Hans. Yesterday, I think it was, uh, giving a talk to the Scottish Conservative Conference. Now, I had a photo from the back of the hall showing almost every seat empty, like just seats laid out, but no one in them, right? This photo, he posted up himself. I want to point something out here. So first of all, you look at this. You can see very few seats, the vast majority of seats, even in this shot, are empty. And then think to yourself, okay, so this is at the front. If the seats at the front are not full, of course you know the seats behind have got no one in at all. And, and, and the reason why I want to point this out is not just because it shows that the Conservatives are particularly unpopular in Scotland. I don't think anyone needs... Um, Anyone needs to point that out. What I want to show this for is because Greg Hans, when he was tweeting about him giving a speech, being a guest at the Scottish Conservative Conference, he tweeted two pictures. He tweeted one of a close-up of him at the lectern, which was fine. And then he posted this one, showing that there was no bugger there. Douglas Ross, the Scottish Conservative leader, he tweeted that he was speaking there and he showed a photo of just him at the front. He didn't show any of the audience to... He disguised the fact there was no bugger there. Greg Hans is in charge of the Conservative Party's local election campaign. So as I go through this stream and I try to point out some things to watch out for, and when we're trying to judge at the end of it when the results come out next week, you know, which party's done well, which one hasn't. I think it will be embarrassing if the Conservatives, and it is possible, but I think it will be embarrassing if the Conservatives end up being able to spin next week as any sort of victory, given that it is the, co the campaign is being coordinated by a man who has so little media now that he will publish a photo like this. But anyway, um, while we do that, I'm just going to put up now. Hang on, I need to. Oh, where's my things? Oh, there it is. Uh, let's just have a little reminder of what happened in 2019. So first of all, we can have a little look. Of um, There's an awful lot of discussion in the chat about wigs needing to come back. I think that's the last thing we need back. Um, they were not as bad. I mean, in their day, they were the progressives. I don't think they'd be considered progressive these days, but in their day they were. Um, but anyway, I mean, you can see straight away here, five of the six parties, the main parties, 
who are going to be duking it out in these local elections have all got different leaders now. This is just four years ago. How much has changed in four years? I mean, the Conservatives have had three leaders since then in the last four years. Four years ago, Theresa May was their leader. Then we had Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, now Rishi Sunak. Absolutely insane. The Lib Dems have gone through a couple, uh, but the Greens have got a different leader now. Labour obviously have, the DUP have. There's only, there's only Michelle O'Neill on that photo who will still be there for this year's. Um, but this was the situation. So the Conservatives did lose. They lost heavily, but Labour also lost. The Liberal Democrats and the Greens both gained heavily. Heavily. Both of them, I think, pretty much doubled their number of councillors. It was a stunning win for the Greens and the Lib Dems uh, four years ago. And the, the crazy thing is, they may actually still make net gains this year as well. Aren't the Whigs all Liberals? Well, in many ways, yes. Uh, not, not like the... I mean, attitudes change anyway, don't they, over time? Attitudes change. Um, you wouldn't really recognise them as, say, the Liberal Democrats these days. Uh, so let's have a look where we are now. This, this, these are the, this is the current state of play. So at the moment, the Conservatives of the seats being fought this time, which is not ex an exact match for the ones four years ago, but it's mostly the same. They've got 3,365. Um, Labour have got 2,131. So Labour do need to gain a lot. Really what you would say is you'd really want... Labour need to challenge themselves to end up with more councillors than the Conservatives. And now that is not going to be easy. The Conservatives would have to lose at the upper end of their fear factor. But it, it, Labour really should come out of this with more councillors than the Conservatives. That should be their minimum standard of victory. But what is a standard of victory? Because the, the problem is... The, so I'll tell you what the situation is. So both the Conservatives and Labour have decided to already state what they think would be a good result, right? The Conservatives have stated that they expect to lose a thousand seats. The implication being if they don't lose a thousand seats, it's a victory. Obviously saying they expect to lose. I haven't. I know there's a lot of polls flying around. I haven't seen anything that, that I know is really accurate. It's very difficult with local elections anyway. But if the Conservatives are saying they expect to lose a thousand seats, they obviously expect to lose fewer. The reason is so that when they end up losing 800, they can say, oh, we did really well. Our campaign went really well. Labour have got an even more laughable uh, statement. They have said that they will have a good night if they have a net gain of 400 seats. No. 400 seats will not be a good night for Labour. Uh, I don't know exactly, because obviously not all of the Tory seats lost will flip to Labour at all. But I would suggest that Labour really ought to be thinking in terms of five or six hundred. I think 400 is at the lower end of acceptability, if I'm honest. But at the end of the day, they're both doing the same thing. The Conservatives are saying we expect to lose a thousand so that when they lose 800, they can go, ah, oh, we did really well. Labour are saying they expect to gain 400. So that when they gain 600, they go, oh, look, we did really well. It's the same game. Uh, the trick is, how do you tell whether someone has done well or not? Uh, the other thing as well to bear in mind, I'm going to focus very much on the number of councillors because I'm interested in the national picture. But what also matters is the number of councils that get flipped. You know, the Conservatives, if I go back where I can see it, um, actually it doesn't say there. But the, council, the, the Conservatives have a lot of councils and you would expect them to lose control. Doesn't necessarily mean control will go to some other party. You, there's probably going to be a lot of councils ending up in no overall control. But there will be uh, a lot of Conservative councils lost, you would think, because they won quite a lot of them in 2019 with by just a few councillors. So... There's lots of councils where if they take even small net losses, they'll lose a lot of councils out of it, um, even though that's not really what I want to focus on. But it is interesting to know how you know, because you can, 
in a general election, you can tell whether a, whether anyone's done well. Like, what is what are the different scales of victory for Labour in the next election? Well, if they can't form a government, it's a loss. It's simple as that. It's a loss. If they can form a minority government after 2019, you would say that was a win. But given where they are now, no, that would be a loss as well. Um, not as bad a loss, of course. If they win a small majority, so they can form a government in their own right, but it's not a large enough majority to be able to silence the rebels, then it's a win, but it's a small win. If they win a large enough majority, say a majority of 30 to 40, which means that they can get most of their primary legislation through without too much trouble, as particularly if it's linked to the manifesto, then that's a solid win, particularly after 2019, that is a solid win. If they have a comfortable majority, say anything 60, 70 or more, uh, that is a, a big win because that also gives them a cushion for the next uh, leg. Because you would expect whatever, however well Labour do next year in the general election, you would expect them to win some seats that will probably flip back to the Conservatives at the following election. Um, so they will expect in there, unless they put in an absolute powerhouse of a, um, of, a, of a shift in their first term in office, which may be unlikely, they will probably suffer losses in the following general election. So having a, a good lead. But you can, well, the point is you can tell what is a victory in a general election. You can't in a local election. The only thing you can really say in a local election, you dislike that photo of Starmer, it's just, to be honest, it is just the common one that comes up. I mean, this is just from Wikipedia. It's not an official thing. I've just taken it from Wikipedia. And if you look, if you put in a search for like Keir Starmer, this is the most neutral photo you'll find of him, which is what they've gone for. Um, but the, um, yeah, in a local election, all you can really say is that the party of government should take net losses and the party of government in waiting should have net gains. But at the same time, if the Conservatives lost just a few hundred seats, that would be a win for them. And if Labour only gained a couple of hundred seats, that would be really bad. Really bad. Uh, anyway, before I go into the really interesting thing, let's just go through a few comments there. Uh, looking at the change on screen, there must be about 500 seats that either went independent or vanished. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is the thing about local elections as well, like, or compared to general elections. In a general election, the vast majority of people flock to either Labour or the Conservatives. Not because they are Labour or Conservative supporters, but because they fundamentally understand that only those two have a chance of forming the government. It's, that's really all there is to it. There might be many people who would prefer the Liberal Democrats or the Greens, um, but they sort of know it's either Labour or the Conservatives really, isn't it? In a local election, it's not the case at all. There are Liberal Democrat councils. There are, you know, the Greens um, can, can have power on councils. All of the other parties, even some, you know, so, and, and also you do have a lot of independents that can win. Independents are very unlikely to win in the general election. You get the odd one. But they're generally unlikely to win. Whereas in local elections, you always get independents winning. You know, pretty much everywhere you'll, there'll be some independents. In, in, in Westminster, an independent MP is almost certainly someone who was kicked out of their party, either temporarily or permanently, for being a knobhead. Whereas in, in local councils, no, there's, there's, there's um, independent councillors who just happen to be prominent members of their uh, community and well-liked members of their community that, that aren't into party politics. So, and that, and that actually is, is quite likely to save the Conservatives as well. The fact that there will be um, even where the Conservatives lose seats, they're likely to lose quite a lot of them to independent candidates. So if you look at how many seats the Conservatives will lose, it will nowhere near add up to the number that the other parties gain because there will be a solid number going to independents. Um,
If the Tories do super bad, it will reflect badly on them and give them low confidence. Well, that is exactly why people are pushing um, the local election so much. Because on the face, in, in literal terms, all it is is on local issues. It is about, like, Labour are playing silly beggars, basically. They're talking about, you know, a vote for Labour is a vote for the NHS and a vote for Labour is a vote for more housing. All those now, the housing actually is a little... Because local councils do have a, a, a role in that. But they have no role in the NHS. So Labour are promising all sorts of things by voting it, um, which they cannot directly deliver by having more Labour councils. But the reason why they're saying it is because it's also a statement on the national um, picture. It's if, if these local elections go very badly for the Conservatives and well for Labour, it's a solid sign that Labour are on the march to government. I mean, there's already been signs, but this, and this was the major one, as I say, I, I said it two years ago, these were the local elections to watch out for. These are the ones where Labour have got the best chance of making big gains. Really big, hundreds. Net increase of hundreds of councillors. Uh, John said, I don't get to vote this time. No, um, there's no elections here, but I am uh, postal. So do we still need ID? No, you don't need ID for postal voting. Uh, that is... The thing is, though, if anyone has found themselves without voter ID or the, the appropriate ID or without postal voting, it is now obviously too late for anyone who is in those areas. Um, but yeah, it's no, you don't need ID for postal voting, only for voting in person. Um, but, so there is something interesting happening as well. Now, there's um, a place called Bracknell Forest. Now, let me get up, actually. If I get rid of this. It's in Berkshire or some, somewhere down south. I don't do down south places. But there's a place called Bracknell Forest. Now, this is a clip from the Stop the Tory uh, dot vote site that is set up to help anyone who wants to vote tactically. I've already done a video on it. I won't go over that uh, again. Uh, Skelly is saying that need a campaign like Nye Bevan. You've been going on the Nye Bevan uh, bandwagon a bit recently. Um, in truth, the... We don't really have a lot of um, politicians with his sort of oratory, unfortunately, these days. And in fact, I think someone mentioned towards the beginning about Rishi Sunak's latest effort. I shall be doing a video about Rishi Sunak's um, efforts very shortly in the next few days. Um, but yeah, the, old, the, the fiery orators just aren't really there anymore. There are some that are decent, but I, I don't think we'd really say there's a... I'm not sure there's any really good orators in the House of Commons at all for any party. I think there are some that are all right. But I don't think there are any real firebrands out there. Uh, Nye Bevan was such a one. I've seen uh, some recordings of him. Um, but then there were quite a few good orators in his day. He was, he was uh, around with, uh, with Churchill as well. I think the last really great one, Tony Blair was good. I think the last really great one was John Smith. But anyway, um, actually, Michael Heseltine was decent as well. John Prescott was all right. He was, he was okay in his day. Anyway, never mind that. Right, what you'll notice here is the recommendations for Bracknell Forest uh, because there's, there's in, a, in any given ward, there's sometimes multiple councillors, right? So you can see here, in some of them there's two, but in most of them there's three. And what's unusual about this is that in each case, in all, no, not in each case, in almost every case, this website is advising you to vote either Labour for all of them or the Lib Dems for all of them. Um, in this case, the Greens, and then it's not sure about the third one. Uh, here's, you've got two Greens and Lib Dem. And the reason for this, because I was reading a report, this made the national news, not the big headline news, but the national news. In Bracknell Forest, in 12 of the 15 wards up for grabs, there's only one of the mainstream progressive parties represented. So if I go down at this top one here, uh, you can't see my cursor, even though my cursor's on it. The top one that's got two greens and a, and a not sure, 
Um, there's only Green candidates standing there. Next one down, there's only Labour candidates standing there. Next one, only Labour candidates. Sometimes there's independents and there's obviously Conservative candidates. But what I mean is, if you think about the, the mainstream progressive parties being Labour, the Lib Dems and the Greens, because remember, there's no, um, there's no local elections in uh, Wales or Scotland. And even if there were, this is in Berkshire, right? So of those three parties, in this top one, it's only the Greens standing. Labour and the Lib Dems not even standing a paper candidate. Because that's what you normally do. You stand a candidate... You don't always, but you mostly stand a candidate. Sometimes they're called paper candidates. They're people that are just your candidate. You don't expect to win. You're not going to knock yourself out campaigning. Um, it's just for the sake of having someone. Whereas in this council, they haven't done that, apart from in three of the wards. So, and the reason for this is this is a very strongly conservative council. Like almost every seat is conservative. Like almost all of this, I... Like, I think it's something like 37 out of 42 of the seats are all Conservative. So ordinarily you would look at this and go, there's no chance of flipping this. There's no chance. But what these parties... Now, they all deny it, I will say. They all deny it. But what it looks like is that people at the local level, not the national level, you'll never get this on the national level, but at the local level, they've obviously got together and gone to themselves, look, are we going to have another arse kicking this year? Or should we have a, a, a quiet little arrangement to only put up candidates where we think we've got a chance? In other words, the other two don't put up candidates in those areas. So we may have a little bit. and it, So this will be one to watch out for. I'll be paying attention to this to see how successful it is because this is here, unofficially, a progressive alliance, which is what people were calling for on the national scale a couple of years ago. Not... People don't do that so much now because um, it now looks like... At the time, it sort of... It was, we have to get rid of the Conservatives, come what may. No one really seriously believed that Labour could go from 200 seats to winning in five years or four years. Um, but the... Um, so people were calling for a progressive alliance, whereas now people sort of think Labour can do it. So there are still people calling for it, don't get me wrong. But I think the calls are now less urgent. But we may see it in action here. And the other thing, I mean, even in my own ward, so I say my ward, it wasn't my ward in 2019 because I moved since then. But I had a look at what happened. Because at the moment, in my particular ward, there are, for two seats, two Conservative candidates and two Labour candidates. So it's actually quite straightforward to know which to vote for there if you're not the Tory. Um, but in 2019, there were independents and green candidates, as well as one green candidate and two independents. This year, there's not. So I'm actually wondering if there's something similar here as well. Maybe people have decided that... the Because the Conservatives in my area won handsomely. They easily won. Uh, the only way to beat the Conservatives in my area is for everyone to get behind a single party, basically. Um, and I wonder if the same things happen. So I'm wondering if on a on a smaller scale, you are going to see the same thing in different parts of the country. It's just that Bracknell Forest, because they're doing it in 12 out of, or because there's very unusual behaviour in 12 out of 15 of the wards, it really does look like it's coordinated, albeit very unofficially. They say, well, Corbyn was a good strategy, a poor strategy, was quite a good orator. I don't agree. I don't agree. He was talking to crowds who already believed with him. A good orator will fire up random strangers. You know, you look at someone like Harold Wilson. You'd go out. Be, he, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have the, the crowds coming to meet him because he'd told all his fans he was going to be at a particular place. He'd be there with the, the mic and the megaphone, just with ordinary members of the public. And they'd be stopping and listening to him. I've never seen that from Jeremy Corbyn. I've only ever seen him speaking to crowds who already know they're going to agree with everything he says. Because that's the mark of a good orator, is they'll, is they'll be talking and people will be walking past and they'll stop and they'll listen to them. It's not just someone who fires up their base. Because you may say Angela Rayner's really good at... Uh, 
uh, saying pushing the right buttons to get the people already on her side fired up that's not oratory oratory is getting people who are either neutral or even against you to at least stop and listen to what you say uh, and i say i live in scotland so i've not seen any local election advertised by parties how full on has it been um in the key areas, which is not my area, I've not seen any uh, uh, you know, big name politicians coming around because it's, it's not really a target area. If, if my area is flipped, that would be remarkable. But in terms of the target battlegrounds, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of visits by um, people from whichever parties are, are gunning for those seats. It has been pretty full on. Uh, there's obviously be because this is it I mean the conservatives because they're struggling for donations I took the piss out of them the other, the other week didn't I they've even had to cancel the cleaners at conservative party HQ they've sacked the staff uh, not just cleaners security and other staff as well but they've had to temporarily sack the staff at their own headquarters so that they can pump every last penny into this campaign so if, if, you know, if any conservative tries to say it's just another set of local elections, it's not. They, they know, the, you know the, the, what it would mean to, 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 to be seen to be doing badly in this one. Symbolically, it will be a massive blow for them. And they've got various problems, the conservatives, if they are seen to do badly in these local elections. The first thing is from the public's point of view, like people, like I keep saying, people are sheeple. As soon as people start to think that the country as a whole is moving towards a change of government, a lot of people start thinking the same thing. And there's yeah, reanimate Harold Wilson. Uh, the problem with him, although he was he was good at that, like with crowds, but he was he famously was very bad. Uh, he, was, he tried to be a talk show host at one point. He was really bad at that. That was an unusual one. But that's because he's not having, you know, he's not trying to stir up a crowd. He was just trying to have a reasoned conversation with someone that's not his enemy. Um, but the, um, yeah, it's, uh, the, the Conservatives have been throwing everything at this and so have Labour. For all Labour saying, oh, we'll be happy with 400 extra seats, bollocks, will they? bollocks they will i they i don't know how many they're actually aiming for definitely more than 400 you know i think they they want 600 i mean if we look at the situation so let's say the conservatives lose 800 then that would put them on to what two and a half thousand i mean for labor to go significantly above the tories tally they probably have to win about 600 seats now, of course, it is possible the Conservatives could lose a thousand. You know, these things do tend to be very close, very tight. And, and also, although there's been a lot this weekend, like Sky News were reporting last night, the polling results, I would say two things about polling results this weekend uh, to caution. First of all, it's incredibly difficult to poll local elections, way harder than general elections. Um, and, and part of that, again, is the relatively the much smaller numbers of people voting in each ward and also the the fact that you can in many wards vote for different parties and feel they have a chance of winning and of course the independence you get a lot of independence winning and it, it, it makes it very difficult to poll people but unless you actually poll people in each individual ward and no one's got the resources for that that'd be madness so it's very hard to do that. The other thing is, there's going to be a lot of campaigning happening between now and then. And, and again, you know, the, this tactical voting website for people who want to tactically vote, I did have to keep saying, I said in the video, the first thing I said is, I'm not telling people how to vote, by the way. This is just for people who've already decided. And, uh, and I still got some comments going, oh, you shouldn't be telling people how to vote. I'm not. And I'll just reiterate it again. I'm not telling people how to vote. But if people want to vote tactically... Um, but that tool's only just launched. So if it's going to gain major traction, then it could well change the way people intend to vote. That's the whole point of it, in fact. So whatever the polling says this weekend for field work done halfway through last week, you would expect it to change quite significantly. 
So if the Conservatives at the moment look like losing between, I think I've seen suggestions they could be on for somewhere between eight and 900 losses. Um, but it could be a thousand. Well, if Labour and other anti-Tory uh, campaigns do particularly well over this final week, that could tip them towards the thousand. It might be a bit too much to expect to be more than that. It'd be hilarious if they lost 1200 because even by their own standards, that would be a defeat. Um, but there we go. Um, oh, Rob, you're standing for Labour in North Fleet. Well, good luck, yes. I don't know where North Fleet is, I'm afraid. Um, uh, Rainer's endorsing her boyfriend. Yeah, but I mean, you know, he's, uh, he's persona non grata after his behaviour last year, really, isn't he? Let's be honest. Uh, would Labour benefit from a theme tune or song? Um, they benefit from doing their own bloody um, PR, really. I keep saying, I mean, I'll keep getting dragged into it. You know, if only they would... If only they would um, use social media properly. Uh, things can only get better by d Ring will be played when they win in 2024. I don't know. They might need another one. Uh, apart from anything else, Starmer will not want to be... Si I mean, what he's aiming to do is not quite the same as New Labour anyway, but he won't want to be seen as just trying to ape a previous administration that existed at a different time with different problems and all the rest of it. So I don't think there'll be any conscious effort to evoke the memories of 1997 they'll want it to be their own thing so if there is to be an election night theme tune um i don't know what it would be um would the results change government policy would a lot of council switches against the conservatives means that they can't do some policies or struggle not as such no um, it could it, it could be interesting though I think the main one I would suggest is Teesside so for any that don't know so Teesside is one of these areas set aside it's one, it's one of the new Brexit free ports and um, at the moment it's controlled by the Conservatives and I think in fact I should check I think that's up but there's a lot of dodginess going on there at the moment the Labour MP has has suggested that basically massive public assets have been sold to a couple of Tories for like basically a fiver I think it works out at a couple hundred quid um, so uh, so I don't actually know what the name of the council would be <laughs> um But that could be Stockton on Tees. That might make sense. Uh, maybe it's not up. Or maybe, because with some councils, it'll only be so many seats up, not the whole council. Um, oh, it is up. But... Oh, it's saying here it's not under Tory control. Well, there's enough Tory councillors there, and it's got a Tory mayor as well uh, I wonder if the mayor's up for election but nonetheless there's some uh, there's some interesting things going on there which you would think at some point ought to have a bit of an investigation uh, you just wish that Stan would shut down Sunak a bit more severely um, I mean it's again there's people have styles you can you can improve the way you come across you can definitely have trained to do that and lots Lots of political leaders have done that. Margaret Thatcher did. Margaret Thatcher had elocution lessons to drop the, the pitch of her voice, for example, because she was considered to have a voice that was a bit too shrill. And that was certainly not the case at the end of her career. She had quite a deep voice, and that was all deliberate. You know, Boris Johnson, like people were taking the piss out of Boris Johnson the other day because he was there not answering questions about the Richard Sharp thing. I think it was yesterday, actually. And uh, his shirt wasn't tucked in at the back. 
he just looked like people were saying he looked like he'd been dragged through a hedge but that's deliberate it's not that he's scruffy i'm scruffy you like you're quite likely to see me like that out and about um if you see me out and about but not boris johnson he he has deliberately cultivated that image but at the same time you can only work within your range you know keir starmer is not going to be a blood and thunder orator so he you know he he is the calm calculating lawyer so you know that's and that'll work anyway because sunak i mean i said from the start sunak is really bad not liz trust bad but he's really bad at coming across and you can see it um in some of his little, little every time he does a little video promo it's a disaster I mean, he did one a few months ago, which ended up with another police fine. Remember that? He was in a car, travelling, doing on something. And his, whoever his idiot advisor was with him going, Prime Minister, take your seatbelt off and turn to the camera. It'll look well good. So he did. And then he got, he got slapped with a police fine for breaking the law by t removing his seatbelt in a moving car. Um, you know, he's... He, and he, the thing I will say in his favour is he's clearly trying. Because, like, what was it, a month or two ago, he tried that cock de geezer thing? All right, all right. It's like, that don't work, Prime Minister. Don't do that again. So now he's trying, uh, like, the video he did today was like game show host. You know, this is what you could have won. And it's, it's... I mean, I think someone said in the comments, even... Someone at the Telegraph, a big Tory supporting paper, said that it was painful to watch. It, it, it was painful to watch. Um, but I'm going to make people watch a bit of it anyway when I do a video. Not just on that, I've got a video on a, a few things. But Rishi Sunak is really struggling to come across well. And he's got basically a year to do it. And the fact that he's trying means that he might improve. But if he doesn't, Remember, he's going to be there in TV debates and really searching interviews during the general election campaign. I don't think he's going to come across well at all. So at the moment, the public are generally satisfied with Rishi Sunak, largely, I suspect, because they're just pleased he's not Liz Truss or Boris Johnson. They're sick of those. You know, they did like Boris Johnson and, and now they don't. Liz Trust they never really liked in the first place, but my goodness, they really didn't like her once she was in power. So Rishi Sunak is like, well, at least he's not like sticking a red-hot poker up our arse every day. So, but it will come unstuck when people start to realise he's got no substance, he's not delivering anything. There's nothing he's delivering. And he comes across really badly. Like, Labour are again starting up the attack lines about him being out of touch that would be very fruitful for him uh, scott morrison spent two hundred thousand dollars on an advisor to teach him how to care well yeah the richie sonic is trying the same thing but you do don't you like the, the the issue is for a senior political leader is you have got to try and some of it, like, say Theresa May, for example. Theresa May was absolutely appalling in the 2017 general election campaign. Absolutely appalling. And yet, apparently, I don't know, but people say that on a one-on-one -on -one situation, like on a personal level, she is actually quite personable and, and she comes across all right one-on-one. -on -one. But that's not enough. You have to come across well to people who will never meet you. They're only seeing you on the television they're not seeing you in person and even if they do it's part of a big crowd and most people aren't going to go for the big crowd things anyway so it's mostly on the television and it's it's about having the right tone of voice the right pattern of speech the right body language to to give those people confidence and and it's millions of people they have to do with this with it's incredibly difficult uh, what do I make of Starmer spokesman saying he was a long time against PR voting? So I am I have had to write a video on that, which will either be out tomorrow or Monday, depending on what other things end up coming up. It now it, I thought it was be tomorrow. It might end up being Monday now. Um, essentially, it's sort of new. He didn't say 
he was a long time. People are reading more into the Byline Times report that is there. There's a suggestion, again, there's a suggestion that his spokesperson has said Starmer is a long time cr critic of PR voting. But because they don't report what was actually said, it's quite ambiguous. But there is still reason to suppose that Labour will get behind PR voting, is what I would say. But I, I will have to go over it in another video. It's one of these, I hate them doing them, because it, it's just like me being effectively an apologist for uh, Labour's latest statement, which is being misinterpreted left, right and centre, but there it is. Um, interesting that in Northern Ireland for the local elections, the posters have been up for some time. First Sinn Féin, then SDLP on different lampposts. A week later, DUP posters above Sinn Féin posters on the same lamppost. Um, yeah, it, see, this it will be interesting, actually, because there wasn't a lot of change in 2019 between DUP and Sinn Féin. There wasn't really a lot of change. Uh, it will be interesting to see if the DUP suffer as a result of their intransigence, um, you know, not, not forming the executive, or even just general chaos, or if, if people are still getting behind them. That'll be interesting. Of course, DUP losses are not necessarily going to be Sinn Féin gains, of course. It's a different thing there. It'd be like UUP or someone, or maybe the Alliance Party. But I think they are, I think in their own way, the local elections are also going to be important to the Northern Ireland parties as well. Uh, it's just my focus tends to be on the national government, therefore what's happening ultimately in England, um, particularly the Labour Conservative head-to-heads. Uh, I've met Keir Starmer, he's a nice fellow, an Arsenal fan, but a nice fellow. Wish he'd project himself how he projected to me, but that's what I mean about on a personal level, people can be very good on a personal level and then not know how to communicate with essentially a camera because that's what you're asking them to do. Reach out to someone that you don't see and you can't know. And I think some people are, they need that personal connection they need to actually see the person they're trying to connect with um and ask them questions and things like that and find out who they are and what they're feeling and all the rest of it um but that's no good you know you, cause that's no good you can't meet enough people for that to do well you've got to you know you've got to be able to communicate but at the end of the day a person is what they are you, you can you, you you can teach them to a certain extent to improve things and he has been improving and as I say you can teach people to vary the pitch of their voice if that's an issue you can you can certainly teach people to adopt a different pattern of, of talking like a different uh, sentence structure if necessary uh, to cut certain words out or bring certain words in um, body language you can train them in but you know you can you can only work with what you've got and, and, and Keir Starmer's not, he was never going to be one of them. It was my big worry for him when he was made leader is, is he going to have that long range charisma, as I sometimes call it? Uh, will Labour make the Electoral Commission independent? It's pretty pointless otherwise. They absolutely should do, yes. Um, do you know what? The thing is, there's an awful lot of things that the Conservatives removed independence from that Labour should restore, but I'm, it's one of those things where I think with some things, depending on how quick and easy it is, I'll bet it's not a priority. Um, I'll bet it's not a priority. But it, certainly I would suggest after the first term, before we go into the next general election, the Electoral Commission should absolutely be fully independent again. But it is one of those things where you can only make it independent while you're in government and then the Tories can immediately stop it being independent when they come back in. So hence the need, and this is why I also think I have confidence in proportional representation at some point in the next decade, because 
Um, it's the only way to protect whatever. Starmer is clearly on a mission to build things, like make massive changes. He can't set those changes in stone. Not possible. Anything he can do, a future government can undo. Ironically, the Conservatives basically found the only thing that they could do that Labour can't undo, and that's Brexit, because ultimately that depends on other countries as well. So even if there was overwhelming public support for rejoining the EU, it's not up to us. It's nothing any, any government can, can decide to follow through on if we cannot persuade basically almost all of Europe to go along with. Uh, I've met JRM, he's evil. I, okay, I haven't met him. Um, I can believe that he's, he's a sociopath. I don't know about evil. I've not always often thought about what I think of evil. I think Sweller Braverman probably is. I was never fully sure about Pretty Patel, even though they seem very similar. I, but I think Braverman delights in the pain she's causing. Whereas I thought maybe with Pretty Patel, it was more political and she wasn't really thinking about the damage caused. But she may have, I don't know, because I haven't met these people. I haven't met any, like, senior Conservative MPs. Uh, do a King's speech for Starmer. He's got plenty of people to write good speeches for him. Uh, it's just the delivery. The delivery has, I think it's improved. I think if you listen to him delivering a speech, uh, say, a year and a half ago, and then more recently, I think it's better. Um... I mean, I did listen to him in person the other week, just before Easter. But again, that was where he was talking to people who were in the room with him. It's very different. Um, it is actually interesting that he, he is different in person, even talking to a group of us. Because he didn't talk to me personally. He was talking to a group of us, but we were all in the room. And, and it was a very different... Um, like pattern of speech really that he did use but it is there you go um starmer has to change things and it's got to stick pr house of lords reform constitutional protection enhancing checks and balances so the house of lords reform is obviously his big thing he will if that doesn't come it will be because he's been blocked it will be that simple. Uh, he's absolutely throwing his weight behind that one. He's also throwing his weight behind removing a lot of the decision making from Westminster. Now, you can get that badly wrong. See, the House of Lords reform, despite Jen Jenny Jones, who's a Green uh, member of the House of Lords, Green Party member of the House of Lords, saying actually the House of Lords is doing its job well, it's like, I don't think it is. I really don't think you can defend the House of Lords as it is now. I think you could at one time because it doesn't need to be elected to just scrutinise government legislation. But the House of Lords, and I can understand some of the stuff they've let through. Some people have complained and said, why have they let it through? And it's because it was in the manifesto. And it's really that simple. It is not up for the, it is not for the unelected House of Lords to block what the House of Commons is considered to have a mandate for. If it was in the manifesto, it's considered to have a mandate, even if it doesn't have public backing. It's, that's the price you pay with your vote. If you vote for a party and they form a government, a majority government, everything in that manifesto, you have given them carte blanche to go ahead with, even if you disagree with it. But the House of Lords have also let some things through that were never part of the manifesto. They had, the Conservatives had no mandate for and they've still let things through. That is, to me, not, not doing their job. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, you, you cannot make the House of Lords worse by making it elected. You still have to make sure the House of Commons is supreme. You don't want a second chamber that can just block the first chamber. It still has to be the same rules that if the House of Commons has got a mandate, it needs to go through. Um, and you can make sure that you can design the system to, to implement that. But there is, there is absolutely no excuse.
for the cronyism which now exists in the House of Lords because it is just basically... I mean, Boris Johnson claimed that the House of Lords was too bloated and he wouldn't be... You know, he, it should be smaller. And yet he has absolutely jammed it full of his toadies. Um, it, it's... it's you, you can't... And it's a job for life. So you can't just come in and kick them, kick out the unsuitable ones. It's a job for life. So the only... Starmer's got no option. He's got to reform it. Uh, saying that I had a debate with JRM about choice, a key Tory mantra. I proved by example that it required money. His feeble excuse was that his constituents supported such views. Oh, they fall back onto, oh, well, I'm actually, it's not my view. It's actually the view of the voters. Well, this is like Brexit itself, isn't it? When, whenever you trap them with Brexit, they'll try and defend it. But when you trap them and they can't defend it anymore, they revert to, well, it's, it, the people voted for it. People voted for it. And it's like, and, and no one should accept that because what people voted for was to leave the EU. They did not vote to leave the sink. I mean, technically, in 2019, if you voted Conservative, you did vote to leave the Customs Union single market. But the Conservatives didn't get a majority of votes then. They got about 43%. If you add on Reform UK, it was another couple of percent, but it was well short of 50%. So they did not get a majority of voters either in the referendum. Or, and when I say voters, I mean people who turned up to vote. I don't mean of the electorate. I'm not counting people who didn't vote at all. I mean actually of the people who voted. They didn't get a majority either in 2016, 2017 or 2019 saying that we should leave the single market and customs union. So whenever they try and say we were just doing what the people wanted, no. You can say that about leaving the EU. You cannot say that about leaving the single market and customs union. There has never been a majority for that. Um, uh, House of Lords should be like the Senate with staggered terms. I, oh, staggered term. Hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure I really want to copy any United States systems of government, if I'm honest. I like their federal structure. But I think there are countries in Europe that have a federal structure we might do better to look at rather than the United States. I don't think the United States is a model of democracy working, in all honesty. Um, admittedly, the problem in America is that you have a two-party system. I mean, in this country, although there are only two parties who can realistically form the UK government, it's not a two-party system. There are other parties in, in there as well. Um, whereas in, in America, there's not. You occasionally get the odd independent in the presidential race. They never, are never even considered a serious prospect. Make Burko a lord, dang it. What, what's the point? What's the point? <laughs> if, if, if Keir Starmer's plan is that in five years' time there are no unelected members of the House of Lords, it doesn't really matter now. You know, we should be appalled that Nadine Doris is going to be made a lord or a baroness in her case. Um, I don't care because if they've, if they've only got about five year, four or five years left anyway, I don't care. <clears throat> uh, Tory still had a higher vote share, 43% than Blair in 1997, 42. Well... <laughs> Blair won a majority with like 30% in 2005. Don't matter, does it? Because that's first past the post for you. What matters is how many seats you win. That's what matters. But in terms of like, all I mean is in term, when you, at the, like Tony Blair, for example, would defend all of his policies. Some of them he bloody well shouldn't do, but he will defend all of his policies. Like if you trap him, he won't, he wouldn't have gone, oh, well, the people voted for it as, if it, as if it was absolving responsibility. My issue with the Brexiteers is when they say, oh, well, the reason we did it is not because we wanted to do it, but because the people voted for it. it was, it's like, no, you don't get to say, I mean, first of all, you campaigned for it, but you don't get to say that because the people didn't vote to leave the single market and customs union. So you either defend your own policy to the hilt or you have to accept that you got it wrong. It's, it's one of those things. You've got to accept you got it wrong or you've got to defend it. You 
cannot fall back on the people voted for it when they didn't. They only get to do that on leaving the EU. And even then, because they didn't get a vote on the specific terms of leaving the EU, even that's a weak argument, but I will accept it as an argument. Um, saying that uh, the German model of federalism works well, especially as our upper chamber is made up of the federal states' governments. See, in a way, that's what Starmer's trying to achieve. We don't have regional governments as such. We have local councils, not quite the same thing. Um, so he can't do it exactly. But the intention is with the House of Lords that it represents the different parts of the UK proportionally. So, um, whereas at the moment, the House of Lords... Like, everyone in the House of Lords could well live in London. And most probably do. <laughs> um, so the plan for the actual, the reformed House of Lords is that it is regional. So you haven't got an upper chamber full of people who pretty much, or, or almost all, live in London. Uh, there is a third party in the US. Are we talking about little fringe reform UK type parties like the Tea Party, which is really just there to, to try and steer one of the bigger parties? Do they have, I mean, but at the end of the day, there is no party if it never wins. If, if it doesn't win, there isn't. Like there's, there's the Yorkshire Party in this country, for example, but it doesn't ever win. It's not got any MPs, it's not going to either, so it don't count as a party. Uh, did I see your comment about Pretty Patel and Swallow Bradman? No, um, I did not. It is Saturday, I'm afraid. Uh, let's try and get through the last one. You may have to repeat it quite quickly before we run out of time. We've got four, four more minutes. Um, House of Lords is just run by Russian money. Well, I, well Westminster certainly is. Um, I mean, we've, got, we've actually got a Lord of Siberia, literally called himself, Lebedev actually called himself of Siberia. Um, but there we go. Uh, the Tea Party, the Republicans, the RG, well, were, they're still about, aren't they? Under PR, Lib Dems would have won as many as 150 seats on their best elections. Well, it is quite interesting because you can look at the vote share and translate that with PR into what probably would have happened. But in reality, it could be... I mean, I don't think the Lib Dems would initially start to win that many, but they would, they would win a lot because... At the moment, there's a lot of people vote either Labour or the Conservative because what they're doing, just as I do, I do that. Lots of people vote for different reasons in the general election, but, but by far and away, the most important reason for people is they're trying to vote the, for the government. It's a direct. That's why people like Boris Johnson supporters are saying that he was the elected Prime Minister and Rishi Sunak isn't. And it's like, well, it's not literally true, it's only figuratively true. Because you don't vote for a prime minister. No one votes for a prime minister. Occasionally, if it's not obvious to the monarch who has the confidence of the house, then there will have to be a vote of MPs. But the public do not vote for a prime minister. But the reason they'll say that is because a lot of people will still troop to the ballot box and put their cross in a box in order to make one or other of the potential candidates the prime minister. So that's why they'll talk about Boris Johnson having been elected, Rishi Sunak not. Um, but the, uh, why do I disappear from my videos? Because it's, sorry, I used the VCam. So I used to use a green screen, but then it broke. I do have other green screens, but they don't work. I've got actually quite a small space to work in and they don't work very well here. I tried them. So I use a VCam, which just automatically gets rid of it. Uh, but if I move a bit too quickly, um, actually, it didn't do too badly there. Uh, but if I do move quite quickly, um, it, uh, you know, it has to try and work out what is me and and remove the rest of it quite quickly. So I, I it works better if I don't move too much, which suits me. Uh, I was saying something I've completely forgotten. Now. Oh, yeah, PR. Um, so lots of people vote Liberal Democrat, uh, sorry, vote Labour or Conservative because they know they want to, they're using their votes to form the next government. They sort of know it's between those two. And they don't really want the messiness of a, a hung parliament. People don't really like, that is what, you know, when the Conservatives like under Miliband and Corbyn talked about Labour will be in the SNP's pocket because the polls co would consistently show 
that although Labour could win more seats than the Conservatives, it would be a hung parliament and they'd need the SNP to shore up their, their votes. Uh, that was the... In 2015, it shouldn't have worked that well because you could say the Lib Dems, but that was the idea because people actually don't want a hung parliament. They don't like the idea. Um, so they're less like... So a lot of people who might ordinarily support Lib Dems, Greens, whatever, will instead just say... Um, will vote for Labour or the Conservatives, which one they hate, whichever one they hate the least, whichever one they hate the least. Because um, that's what a lot of people do in this country. They don't vote for what they want because we are first past the post. You vote for what you least despise. <laughs> Whereas if we had PR, all of those people could then vote Lib Dem or Green or whatever they wanted. Yorkshire Party. Pirate Party. There's a pirate party. We have a pirate party in this country. Doesn't do very well. Maybe it would do better if, um, if, if we had proportional representation. Maybe it wouldn't. Um, we might get a monster raving loony party candidate. Um, right, really quickly, we're running out of time. Whether Labour introduced PR or not, I certainly hope they reduce the minimum voting age to 16. Yes, I fully agree with that. Tories are benefit from an increasingly ageing population. Yeah, 100% with that one. Uh, and in fact, with that one, see, PR... I think we can safely say we're not going to get that in the next parliament. We may get it after. But I do think there might be something, not because I've heard anything, but it's the sort of thing they could put in the manifesto and I see no reason for them not to, to reduce the voting age to 16. I see no argument against that. I don't see how anyone can object to it. I don't see how anyone would switch their votes based on it. Although, obviously, Labour would have to do their homework on that one. Don't put anything in the manifesto that you haven't, like, polled to death. Um, but I would, yeah, I think it's very difficult to say that someone who's old enough to pay their taxes and go into the army isn't old enough to vote. I think, yeah, I think they could easily put that one in. Uh, the German Pirate Party made it in several parliaments. All right. Germany's had PR in place for much longer, though, although it's not, I know it's not quite fully PR as I would prefer it, but it's, it's still... But anyway, right, end last one. If we had PR and the Monster Raven Loonies got in, we'd probably have free jellies. Not, I like jelly. As long as it's not blackcurrant jelly. I don't like blackcurrant. In fact, actually, it's quite funny. Uh, I'll leave you with this last thought. On my first date with my partner, we went to a cafe and she got the drinks and she says, what would you like to drink? And I just said, well, a soft drink because I don't like tea or coffee or anything like that. And she says, OK, well, what would you what would you like? And I said, anything apart from black currant. So she goes there. She's got in her head then black currant. What does she bring me back? Black currant juice. Naturally, as a gentleman, I say nothing. And she realised much later on that she'd got me black currant. Well, no, she realised a few dates later when she get drinks in again, but it's like at a, we went to the deep in Hull. And so they're like cartons and she brought an orange and a black currant back. And I said, well, I'll have the orange, please. And, uh, and she said, oh, I thought you liked black currant. I said, no, I hate black currant. And then it twigged. Um, so for our first anniversary, she likes candles. I think a lot of women like scented candles. And I got her a black currant scented candle as a joke. But anyway, there we go. Um, We'll leave it there. Uh, thanks very much for coming on, everyone. This time next week, we'll have the results because even though some of them will still be trickling on Saturday, we should have them uh, by, apart from maybe the odd difficult ward, by this time next Saturday. We'll certainly have the general lay of the land. Um, I will not be doing a live stream on the coronation. <laughs> I am a monarchist, but I'm not interested in, in uh, the, the putting a hat on someone's head. Um, so I will be talking about, unless there's a massive political news story, I will be talking about the actual results. Uh, but thanks for coming on. Have a very good evening, everyone. And until next time, I'll see you later.